Uh, our next, call, uh, next talk is uh, by uh, Miltos Alamanis. Uh, Miltos uh, has received his uh, PhD uh, working with, with uh, Charles Sutton, and he, he's been exploring the, the topic of uh, modeling uh, source code and applying machine learning techniques for, for a while, and now he's exploring this topic at uh, Microsoft Research uh, in Cambridge. And uh, uh, so he, he's been uh, proposing the use of graph neural networks, uh, and uh, today he's going to tell us about uh, the, the state of the art in this, uh, in this field. Thanks, Victor. Hi. Uh, so, okay. Uh, in general, we've, you've heard about uh, graph neural networks before, uh, but I'll, uh, I'm trying to, here to kind of mention uh, two of our most recent work. Uh, and the goal of this is that we set out to try to use machine learning to understand the, the structure and the re very rich structure that source code has. And in that sense, uh, graph neural networks allow us uh, to do that. And it's one way to represent programs in this uh, machine learning compatible, let's say, way. So the, the rest of the talk will be structured as follows. I will not give any motivation since uh, Liam did that yesterday. And I'll just go directly describing uh, how we uh, graph neural networks work, how we can represent uh, code as graphs, as a form of a feature if you want. And then I will discuss two applications that we've recently explored this, uh, that have to do with, let's say, understanding code and another with generating code. And finally, uh, yeah, hopefully there will be some time to discuss uh, issues about how uh, research and uh, the papers we've written kind of uh, appear in real life and how what are some of the learnings there. So, uh, let's get started with graph neural networks. Uh, the basic thing of graph neural networks is that we humans design a graph and we give it as an input directly uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the machine learning model. So now each node in this graph has some associated data and we can do anything we care about this data and at the end of the day we can encode it as a sequence of as an embedding or a set of labels or whatever we want. But essentially at the end of the day it's a distributed vector representation. And I'm going to represent this uh, with this uh, small envelope here. So uh, what's, uh, what's happening is now that uh, each node has this initial representation. And now we have, uh, we have different edges and the edges have types. So we have edge of type 1 or of uh, type 2. And uh, this is essentially the problem over which graph neural networks uh, work, uh, work on. And what, uh, this is based on work uh, that's uh, done previously in uh, Microsoft uh, research and elsewhere. And Danny and Mark had been involved in that uh, early on. So uh, the, the, the general way of thinking about this is uh, we endow each point in here with a recurrent uh, neural network unit, which I'm going to, uh, to represent here as this uh, small triangle. And now we're going to do something that is uh, nowadays called a neural message passing. The idea is that each node, let's take for example this node here, will receive messages from its direct neighbors. So for example this node will send uh, a message to this, uh, to, to this node here. And the same thing will happen for the other nodes. So now a node has received messages from its direct neighbors and it's going to aggregate these in, in, in some form. For example, just summing up uh, these messages. And again, these messages are simple distributed vector representations. So once you have uh, these messages, let's say you aggregate them with a summation and you have your current state, you can use the recurrent unit, which is this triangle here, to compute a new state. So at this point, what's happened? Each, uh, each, ne me message, each node sent to its neighbors uh, a message. So at this point, the, in each node kind of knows about uh, the distance one neighborhood. But then, then a new message passing round comes in and now their neighbors have received messages from their own neighbors. So then we essentially increase this receptive field. We increase the amount of data that each node has. So graph neural networks. We start with a graph representation of the problem. Uh, we get the initial node representations that have the data. That could be anything uh, that we care about. We do this neural message passing and at the end of the day each node has a representation here that represents not just information about itself but how it belongs uh, within the graph. 
So this is how graph neural networks work and people have used them in many different ways. So you can get uh, the representation of one node and do a classification, so, so for example, label each node. You can aggregate the, the embeddings that you've uh, you got out of the graph and do some form of summarization of the graph, or you can do things like node selection and so on. So this is a kind of a really fast introduction over graph neural networks. And uh, the reason we're interested in them is we want to represent code as graphs. So how do we do that? Yes, Sid. Well, there could be more than two edge types. There are different edge types uh, in that sense. So, but yeah, I, I show that we essentially have different uh, types of edges, and this will def change how uh, the graph neural network m propagates information, does, does the message passing over those edges. So, by the way, one thing I found really confusing, how do I want to get this? The graph structure is nothing to do with neural network architecture. You know, the same neural network architecture can represent graphs of arbitrary sizes and topology. Yeah, so the, well, it, uh, the message, well, depends how you view it. Like in a, in a recurrent neural network, again, it's not as, your graph neural network is not a sequence, it's a single recurrent unit that re repeats itself. So you can think of this as essentially each node has, this, uh, has an RNN-like thing and its state gets updated at each point, but it receives messages uh, from, its, uh, from its neighbors. And their neighbors are informed, so you get more and more information. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, how we represent, uh, represent code as graphs. Obviously this is a design decision, it's not something that is uh, prescribed by the graph neural networks. Uh, so let's first start by embedding syntax, that's easy. Uh, we have uh, syntax compared to natural language, uh, we don't have any ambiguities. Uh, we can tokenize the code and connect the tokens in a very boring chain uh, that you see with a special uh, type of uh, edges here. And we also have the abstract syntax tree which we can also kind of uh, connect things together with these uh, blue kinds of edges. That's okay, we have everything about syntax, but we have not included something about uh, semantics. Yes, Rishabh. So, even this example, is it the case that even a single expression like that turns into a, like a giant graph? So do you see that problem that uh, small programs become large graphs? Or? So uh, it's, in general, the AST is much more verbose, especially for real programming languages like uh, uh, that, uh, that yeah, use quite a lot of, uh, have a lot of syntactic sugar, so they need to add a lot of things to make things more uniform. Uh, it's, it's quite large and uh, uh, on average, uh, we, we do some pruning here. So for example, in C Sharp, an identifier has, is the token, which is connected to an identifier name always, to, uh, and so on. So we collapse this thing. For example, we do some small compression steps. Uh, but, but yeah, in, in general, it's like in any tree, the leaves are just only a small portion of the full number of nodes. So, yes, Earl. What you do to differentiate the edges, edges that connect the leaves from the interior nodes? Well, these are next tokens. So this is kind of, it implies a different relationship between these nodes. Uh, so here, for example, one thing that's not encoded in here, and you can arguably say that this should be encoded, is that the member acts expression is the first uh, argument, the expression of the, the mem is this, and the uh, axis is this. So this is just child, the same edge. So you can argue that this is a different kind of relationship compared to this different relationship, and we hope the neural network can learn from it. Uh, something can be beyond, uh, uh, you know, something, something more. You give more information to the network. Uh, Martin. So I guess I'm wondering, like, is it just essentially hard code, right? Like, the edges are essentially... Yes. Like yes. You mean the edges? Uh, yes, and this is hard coded too, yeah. right? It's, uh, I mean, it's uh, you. Okay, so machine learning has this tendency to do, try to learn things that we already know, like uh, syntax or like this. So I don't think we are going to get anything by learning the type of edges. So we just ha essentially have a, the feature extractor knows that this should be this type of edge. And that's, that's good enough. It, but it's, you can argue that we may want to refine these things. And that's, that's a good question. Can the machine learning help us 
figure out these feature engineering kind of tasks. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Just to clarify, the, the training in, in response to Shab's question, the training time grows linearly with the size of the graph. The training time is uh, grows. Uh, no, it's well. It depends your hardware. Like if you have a GPU and your GPU does uh, things in parallel, uh, for every node you you only have this number of propagation steps that you have. This is the main cost you have, assuming you can parallelize everything here. Obviously, that's not entirely true. So there is some cost. Parallelize is like increasing the body of text. You know, if you have text, you're doing RNNs with text. It's just you increasing the amount of text. So in RNNs, you need the RNN needs to run from the beginning of the sequence to the end. So this is uh, essentially you have this linear uh, requirement, whereas here we have the eight propagation steps, let's say, that, which is what we have used. So it means that uh, anything that's beyond distance eight, they w it won't communicate. But uh, in that sense, you trade off, uh, you make this trade off here. At least for, this is for the synchronous uh, version of the graphing networks. I will later mention down the talk an uh, synchronous version of this. So is it easy to batch training? Yes, yeah, we have an open source implementation. I will so uh, the general idea is that uh, when you have variable size things like graphs, uh, instead of batching them, adding an extra dimension, we flatten them out. So we have one huge graph with many disconnecting components, and this can be batched uh, very efficiently, essentially. Wait, one huge graph that captures what? Uh, you get you have multiple graphs in your batch, and you can transform it to one graph with many disconnected components. And this is a uniform after that because it's, it's, it's still a graph. It's a single graph in that sense. Don't the nodes update their state in response to the messages they receive? Yes. So then they do communicate past eight. Is if I communicate from one node to one node. Well, there, but there is no way if eight is the number of message of step propagations, you will never get uh, a message, uh, you, a no message will arrive past distance eight. The, n the number of hops that this has to do. It's like VPPP, but eight steps. Yeah. I, I suspect, all yeah. The mess, all the nodes send at the same time, receive at the same time. So I see. And I think if you go back to the, uh, 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 the edges that we extract, I think I, I wanted to make one, one point that's often a little bit unclear. If you project to the, I think this is red, uh, to the red edges, you essentially have the RNN view of, uh, the, the token level view of source code. And so this part of, of the graph is essentially how you would treat it as an RNN. And then if you look at the, the blue edges, it's very much like uh, the, the syntax tree, AST uh, view, where you have a tree neural network. And so these things coexist in the same network. And then there's the additional edges that will appear on the next slide. And so the, the main point really is that um, th this is more of a, of a union of all these other approaches. It's not so much replacing it with but, but it's a union where you limit the horizon. More than yes, but real, okay. realistically, I mean, we saw this in, in uh, Iran's uh, 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 drawings. Realistically, these things can't uh, see behind uh, beyond the horizon of eight or ten uh, anyway. And uh, outside of like these pathological examples where they count up to thousand, an LSTM can't count up to eight anyway. <laughs> these things are really not powerful. Okay. So uh, more edges. This was syntactic edges, uh, boring, uh, uh, but uh, useful. Uh, let's also add data flow edges, and we do that. So forget the previous edges still exist. I'm not showing them for clarity. Uh, we can start adding things, more semantic facts that we can derive from uh, relatively simple program analysis. So data flow, for example, we can add a last use edge. We are here. Uh, let's say that's uh, y. When was y? Uh, last uh, used. Well, if we're just entering the loop, it's here. If we're looping, it's itself. So we can start adding these edges. We can also add a last write edge, where it was y, for example, uh, last written. Uh, well, uh, we have uh, we only have this edge here, and we can also add a computed from edge, for example, that uh, x is computed from x plus y, and we keep we can keep playing this game and adding more and more features as long as we uh, as edges essentially as long as we believe that. That these are uh, these are useful, and uh, this is how we create the graphs from code. So uh, so far, uh, that's uh, we've created the graph structure, and I also mentioned before that we need the initial state uh, state.
updates of the nodes for the graph neural network. So what happens here is we start uh, from uh, a label. This could be a variable name in this case. And we also have types because right, in some cases, like C Sharp, we, we, uh, we have a good amount of types. So how does this uh, work? Well, uh, we get the name and we split into subtokens because names are aggregated together. They're very sparse otherwise. And for each of those subtokens, we learn a single vector representation for them that's trained jointly along with everything else. And uh, we essentially embed each of those tokens and we do average pooling. At the same time, we have types uh, here. We have a, the rich type lattice that uh, we can get. We say that a string implements an object or implements an enumerable of characters or all the things like that. And we have a set of types uh, that are implemented. Again, we're going to learn a single vector representation for each type. And we're going to do max pooling since, since this is a lattice, it feels slightly better. And we're going to concatenate this. And uh, we now have uh, the initial uh, states of the nodes. So we have the initial states of the nodes, uh, we have the graph structure, we can do message propagation, and then what? Uh, so the next step is to actually define a useful task, to define uh, something that's, uh, uh, that's reasonable uh, to, to do and essentially have an objective where gradient descent can work over. So the first task, which is in the code understanding kind of domain, is this uh, variable misuse task uh, that uh, we've introduced in this iClear paper this, uh, earlier this year. So the task is as follows, and this is a real snippet, uh, snippet of code uh, from, uh, uh, from an open source uh, C Sharp project. We blank out a variable like uh, this one here, and we want to ask our machine learning model form the variables that are in scope and type correct, assuming there are more than one, uh, which one should we place in this blank here? Now, uh, there are things to note here is that this is not something uh, that, uh, that is necessarily easy and obvious uh, at, each, uh, at each time, and many times people make mistakes. So in this case, maybe you've been looking at this uh, result uh, and you probably realize that, well, the developer checked class and said, well, not null class, then first, then what here? Well, first, right? And that's exactly what our machine learning model thinks, but the developer probably because they copy-pasted uh, the lines, they added class. So we kind of uh, tend to find uh, these mistakes. It, it's really not worth it to say that, first of all, this is not something easy to find with any traditional static analysis tools. First of all, this is type correct. So the type system uh, won't, uh, uh, won't save you because uh, all of those substitutions are type correct. Then you can say, yes, I can write a linter or a st another static analysis tool that checks if I check that a variable is dot null and then I never visit it again uh, then, uh, and then never use it again, then checking it again is redundant. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's feasible. But then you can need to write thousands of those small rules that maybe this rule would never fire ever again. So the idea here is that uh, we want to learn uh, these from patterns in code. Go on GitHub, get all the open source projects, learn patterns and try to infer those rules that, uh, maybe soft rules if, if you may, uh, that will catch these kinds of bugs. There may be bugs that are simple once you see them, but where you're in the code you kind uh, of miss them. So we had the graph for this, and now the question is how do we solve, uh, solve this problem? Or how do we get uh, machine learning uh, to get uh, towards this problem? So in order to do that, we create a special node, uh, this slot node here, that we syntactically connect to everything, uh, to everything else. And now for each candidate variable, for each variable that we could place here, so it's in scope and type correct, uh, we, create a, we create a candidate node. So in this case we just had two, so that's first and class. And now the tricky part comes where we connect these candidate nodes, and this is a design decision again, uh, that where we connect these nodes, the first for example, as follows. If first was in the slot, how would data flow around it? If class was in the slot, how would data flow around it? Uh, 
So this is uh, this kind of speculative analysis is very tricky, and this is, has been a part of a lot of a lot of engineering work and a lot of issues there, especially not in straight line code, but when you have loops, you have conditionals, all these kind of things. Uh, but this thing here gives us uh, a way to have an objective, and the objective is that, as you remember, the graph neural network gets a representation at the end of the day uh, of uh, of the all nodes in the graph, and what we want to say is that given some function f that could be, for example, the cosine similarity or the inner product or something like that. The, we want the representation of the slot here, of that node, to be as close as possible to the representation of the correct variable first and as far away as uh, possible from everything else. So in that sense, uh, this, uh, we, we kind of implement this, which is just a softmax uh, in, in, in practice. So this is our uh, un code understanding kind of, yes, Rishab. So you mean uh, use the representation of this and use the representation of the slot code and do like a softmax over uh, some some example. So yeah, well the, the thing is you need it's not the name of the method itself as the name of the variable. It's how it's used elsewhere in the program. So in that sense, you, uh, we need to somehow represent that uh, how first is uh, is used elsewhere. So. We could do something like that. I don't think it would work as well, but may maybe there is something there. I, uh, yes, that, that, that could be interesting to sit. So, sure, I mean, this is solves only the variable misuse problem, which is arguably a very narrow uh, set of bugs. But uh, the question is, how do you construct an objective that's meaningful if you want to do a bigger snippet, for example, something like that? Well, that's uh, the next part of the talk. I think the generation thing, assuming that we can reach that. Um, so, uh, okay, we have the graph, we have the objective, how do we do? We have this open source uh, implementation uh, here uh, that uh, does this with a sparse implementation uh, on relatively old hardware. We can essentially batch those graphs together and uh, we get about 70 graphs per second and so on. Uh, so it, it can actually scale to reasonable, uh, reasonable data and in newer, uh, newer GPUs, I think results will be uh, quite uh, much, much faster. So, yeah. How big are the graphs? So, uh, do I? I don't think I have the statistics now. I the, them yesterday, okay. Three thousand nodes uh, per graph, and uh, about uh, nine thousand edges in each graph. So it's. It's not lines exactly because you have the data flow edges. So you might use I, for example, you, you, in the next token, and you include it because it's nearby. But then I might be used a hundred lines above. So essentially, we start from uh, from these three nodes, and we uh, we essentially get the graph that is up to distance fifteen, let's say, uh, and uh, uh, and prune essentially and keep only this portion of the graph. We string only because we know that GNN won't uh, propagate information beyond the X steps we care about, uh, so it doesn't make sense. It, it's, I, I don't have any statistics in that. In that sense, because it gets like, uh, it gets like uh, I think eight usages of a variable at most. So if they are across a thousand lines, as you can imagine getting each line of the usage of the variable, more or less. Yes. Have you ever considered not bounding the number of steps, but basically computing an approximate fixed point in the graph? Uh, that's a question for Danny and Mark, I think. Uh, they've, uh, I think the, it has been tried. It, these things don't necessarily converge. Uh, if you could do that, that would be basically you would be able to compute any approximation to the, you know, the denotational semantics of the program. Because yes, uh, but I think currently where that's an approximate kind of <laughs> place that these things don't necessarily need to run them to converge, so you don't get any guarantees anyways. It's neural networks at the end. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll need to move on uh, and uh, uh, we can catch up <laughs> offline on this. 
So, uh, okay, data, uh, that's easy. We go GitHub, uh, uh, we get open source uh, projects, and uh, we play this game. For each variable where there is more than one type correct in scope var uh, variable, we blank it out we ask our machine learning model to predict back what goes in here. And we have about 2.9 million lines of code. That's a quite large, uh, a large data set. And we learn over that. And uh, we first get some projects. We get some files of the projects uh, to train some files in the validation set, some in the test set. And as you can see, the graph neural network performs better compared to other competitors that essentially uh, look either at a flattened data flow or just uh, at a few tokens. We've also kept a set of data that we've never seen uh, before uh, and uh, the new projects, new domains essentially. And you can see here again, obviously the performance is, is slightly worse, uh, but the graph neural networks seem to generalize better. They seem to kind of learn more about how we as humans code and some of, of, those, uh, of those patterns. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's the part of the understanding. I think let's if you have any questions, that's the time, and I'll move to, yes. So, so one can build a tool uh, for, uh, for developers to, to point to, uh, to, to do such facts as you, you have shown? Yes. Have you tried to deploy such tools? Yes. I'll, if we reach the last part of the talk, we'll get, we'll <laughs> get there. Uh, so uh, the next thing is, okay, we can understand code in that sense. So we can, uh, we can find these small bugs and it implies some form of understanding. It's still very uh, somewhat shallow compared to what humans achieve, uh, but we are on a pathway uh, towards getting there. So one question is how do we go, out, uh, go around and generate uh, code uh, with, uh, with graphs, with these, uh, with these kind of models? So let's say we want to generate an expression and we have a few variables in scope. So the traditional way of, of generating code is by taking the AST, uh, taking a tree representation, and at each point we expand the leftmost, bottommost non terminal and keep repeating this again and again and again. So, uh, so essentially what happens now is that uh, we can generate trees, but that's not enough. We want to generate uh, some form of graphs. So what uh, we can do is, because, uh, because code is very deterministic uh, compared to natural languages and other things in machine learning, is that as we do this process, we can start adding additional edges. So we know here that uh, the last use of i is from here to here, so from the context uh, to here. Or maybe the next, the ne last token between i and minus is this uh, token here. And we essentially can reformulate this process of generating a tree where at each point we introduce new edges, like the last token and last uh, used here, and so on. So uh, how do we represent this in a machine learnable way? Our, uh, in, our inspiration comes from uh, attribute grammars, and we do something that we call neural attribute grammars. And the idea is now that each node has two uh, attributes, the inherited attributes and the synthesized attributes. And this will be just a vector representation, so embeddings, if you wish. And now the idea is as follows. When we reach the point of generating the expression, uh, we will have the representation for the inherited thing here. When we gener finish generating the subtree below the expression, we will update the synthesized, uh, the synthesized representation. So, okay, now uh, using this kind of framework, we can do the following. We have the representation here, and as we generate the, 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 the children here, we transfer some information down. And, and we can repeat this process again and again. But now because we have additional edges, and what happens here is through this last use uh, edge, we can also transfer information. We can also use information, uh, reach information from the context uh, that we have deterministically added with this, uh, with this edge here. And we keep repeating this, and, but at the same time, we need to compute uh, to transfer information up the tree. So how this works is that we again use information from i and the previous state of the expression to compute, uh, to compute uh, the other attribute and keep repeating this again and again and again. And I will show the full thing because it would take a lot of time. So if you look at this, the way we generated this is now we kind of have a way of looking, we start, we start with the expression, we create the second expression, then we created i, and generating variables is a special module. I'm not going to talk about it because we essentially need 
generate only things from uh, that are in scope and uh, we generated the expression this expression uh, we updated uh, its state and we also added things like the next sibling from here to here so this kind of defines a sequence in time and as you can see this defines a graph but a direct acyclic graph so this essentially now uh, now this inf implies uh, that we can also use our, our graph neural network framework so we turn to a flavor of graph neural networks that, uh, again, is, is in previous uh, work, and we call sequential graph neural networks. The idea here is that as we generate this, uh, this graph, at each point we can only propagate messages that are relevant to this time step. So we have a schedule of these propagations that are only updating what's, uh, what's necessary. So this kind of generates, uh, impl gets you the generation process and uh, at the same time instead of using just one or two uh, sources of information, we uh, use as many as uh, they are available at each point. Okay, so what the, tar the target task for this we're we are going to target is the following. We're going to blank out a single expression uh, from uh, the code, given the, all the surrounding code, and we're going to blank out an expression. And we focus only on string, boolean, and uh, arithmetic uh, expressions. And we're going to uh, ask the model, can you fill in the blank here? So this is, uh, in some senses, an underspecified task, uh, because you don't necessarily uh, get to actually have uh, understand what the developer is doing just from the context, not even a human in, in many cases. So how do, does this work? First, we represent the surrounding code as a graph, as I mentioned earlier, and with a, the classic, let's say, graph neural network, you get a representation for the whole and a representation for each in-context uh, var uh, variable. And then we use the sequential graph neural network that I showed uh, just uh, in the previous slide to predict, uh, to predict uh, the expression. So in this case, that's param count uh, greater than method param count. So uh, let's look at the, the results, how this, uh, this looks like. Uh, first of all, you can think of this as, uh, uh, as a language model, so you can compute perplexity. You can ask how many of these, uh, of these uh, expressions are actually type correct, like you're filling in an if condition, it must be a Boolean, not uh, any other kind of expression. And what percent of those things we have an exact match? So if we start with our encoding as a graph and we just generate a sequence without a notion of variables, uh, that really doesn't work well. If we look at the tree and, but produce this in a top, uh, top to bottom, left to right fashion without propagating information across sibling trees, for example, that work, kind of works, but not that well. And uh, we also have this ASN model. This is from Yin and Newbig, uh, who used it for semantic parsing, which traverses this extra information, as you can see, once, it, once a leaf is finished, the, the information is propagated get it back up uh, to the parents. And this works quite well, uh, but the, the neural attribute grammar kind of works uh, slightly better, achieving a, achieving a better exact uh, match and a better kind of performance metrics in this case. And just uh, to, uh, to kind of uh, hit the same point, if we represent the source code as a sequence, uh, sequence then the results are also not uh, really good. Uh, so the graph representation as of the enc encoding the surrounding uh, code in a graph uh, kind of makes sense. So some examples here. Here are two, uh, two kind of uh, uh, examples. Uh, the first thing is that our model, as you can see, it kind of understands that param count and method param count are the two things we want to compare in this condition. And maybe that's the, the subtraction here is something that helps. Whereas uh, the other, other models kind of don't get that. They get that something must be using maybe param count in this case, uh, but it's, it's not clear. So this is about encoding how often how encoding of the context, but also encoding how we have used the context so far during the generation process. Another example here uh, is uh, this uh, relatively simple ex string expression, uh, where again you can see this model kind of understands that URI is going to be used here, and uh, we need to check, because we do this as a substring, we need to check whether it contains or starts with. Uh, it's, it kind of has uh, gets that something is happening uh, with URI here, whereas the purely syntactic model, again, it understands that URI should be used, but it's not necessarily as, as confident about uh, its predictions. Yes? You, you pull out a, a string out of, a, or these are not really strings. 
Um, I'm surprised that you can synthesize this. Uh, so we, we this, the, this string here is just unstrict string literal. That's uh, we're in for string literals and uh, all literals. We kind of are satisfied for now, uh, with the exception of the perplexity uh, encoding. But yeah, that's Martin. Yes, yes. So we're conditioning on everything but uh, this part here. Otherwise, that, that that would be harder to understand for the model to predict what's going to be in here without knowing what's in the return value. So it's it acts as a form of a very weak specification uh, with the, with patterns in that sense. It's more like the, the variable misuse task of related to expressions mm -hmm. instead of. Some other <coughs> Okay, so um, out of time, I don't know if we can spend three more, five more minutes in, <laughs> in this part. So, um, okay, so uh, we obviously do this work in Microsoft, so there is some interest in, in putting some of these ideas into real life and uh, uh, in, uh, into production. And as you all probably know, there is a gap between uh, writing a good paper and having good numbers in the paper versus having something that uh, users like. I'll, uh, very briefly, we uh, earlier this summer, uh, Visual Studio kind of announced the Visual Studio IntelliCode effort. Uh, they have uh, some uh, auto-completion uh, machine learning based auto completion, statistical auto completion uh, in there, but we also demoed the variable misuse thing uh, within, uh, within the users uh, in a user kind of setting. And uh, here, for example, you can see that this is a, a relatively simple example. Once you see it, uh, what happens is that uh, the, de the developer said, well, x2 minus x1, y2 minus x1 again. So this is, this is something you can easily miss when, uh, you, uh, when you actually uh, write code, but this is obvious after the fact. And uh, I think these are the kind of mistakes that this model can capture and it can be of use. And here the model says, why, well, maybe instead of x1 would you like to use y1 here so this is uh, we have some experience in trying to test these things test these ideas and I'd like to mention uh, kind of four interesting challenges and uh, issues that are here and I think uh, the first thing is the user interface and the user experience and uh, again I don't have time to go into this and uh, Iran also alluded to this uh, but there are many interesting questions about how do we make our tools actually useful it's different to get something that uh, in the right time for the developers so that they care about it in a, the uh, right place, in the right even the wording of things, everything. The next thing is, I think, the machine learning capabilities. And I think still, from the machine learning side of the community, we still have a lot and lot of work to do in how we combine this rigid, strict, formal, mathematical, if you may, structure of code with something that looks that's softer, something more that is, uh, uh, that's more like uh, patterns. And uh, I think we still have a lot of research to do in the machine learning community, and maybe uh, some things that Swart showed, for example, earlier today, uh, how do we combine these two things? How do we combine this symbolic uh, way of thinking and the and the and the pattern, the soft uh, way uh, of things? The next thing, which is I think it's the most interesting, in many cases in uh, in software engineers, software engineers care about things that we cannot really measure. So there are things like. Uh, how good is your architecture how, of, of your system? Uh, how good is, uh, how do users engage uh, with, uh, with uh, your, uh, your, your product, whatever this is? There are many things that uh, we cannot measure in a sufficiently good way. And in machine learning, we always need an objective. We always need a, a metric to optimize. And this is, I think, it's, it's an important problem in many cases. How do we actually uh, find uh, a way to use those models models and to train those models that need to have a clear objective that they can just do great in the sand on, for example, and, uh, and learn. And finally, at the end of the day, uh, I think, yes, there is, we live in the era of big code. We have tons of code uh, on, uh, on, on GitHub and uh, other open source uh, places uh, and within organizations. But we don't, we, we are in a low resource kind of scenario here. We don't have an implementation of a thousand operating systems so that we can learn and generalize, so that we can help the developer uh, developing the thousand of first operating system to do that. Uh, not operating system, not data 
database system, almost nothing. So there are questions, how do we kind of we use uh, efficiently learn from relatively low resources to get uh, and, and get something that's useful for a developer that's creating the new thing that's never been out there. We can, how can we generalize in a, in a strong way? <coughs> Okay, so that's uh, most of the talk. Uh, I think, uh, I hope that I appreciate that the graphical networks are a valuable tool. Uh, the, w there are two kind of applications I've showed, but I think there are many ways of using this structured form of learning. And I think we have many open, open problems as a community to solve both in the machine learning, programming language, and software engineering uh, uh, communities. Um, I've recently co-authored this survey in uh, uh, mo mostly it's models that use use pure, purely machine learning uh, for, for code in more deep neural networks, things like that. You may find uh, some of the things that are interesting. Obviously, that doesn't cover the whole area uh, because that wouldn't fit in a normal uh, article. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Martin, uh, this a question to both you and Eran. Okay. Uh, so it seems like in both of these approaches, there's this uh, idea of uh, using some knowledge about the programming language, right, to generate these mm -hmm. features, and then you learn over those structures, right? Now you're learning over graphs, and you are learning over these bags of sequences. But yeah, so is there any intuition about where you know you would need one and not the other? Um, so I mean, it's uh, the I think that's uh, like so. One surprising thing that uh, was in my PhD, at least, uh, is was that the the sequence of tokens around a variable are very informative about the variable name, about many things of the, about uh, about the variable, and that's very counterintuitive to I think the PL view of things, where everything is a semantic thing. We don't care about the tokens; it's just a convenient way of representing this. So I think there is. Uh, my perception, I don't know where Anne's perception is, that there is a good question of maybe some things are language specific, like uh, Java and C Sharp or have this structure, and but Haskell wouldn't. Uh, and it's, I, th I think it's adding the semantic information when you actually need it, uh, and you can encode it. It's, it you ask really asking the model not to learn something that it, it's already deterministically known. So I think that's that you cannot lose. You only lose engineering effort. <laughs> but it's graphs versus sequences, right? So, so in both yes. cases, there is some of the semantics. Sure, sure, sure. It really depends on the task. So for tasks that you need uh, very high precision, I think you will need to inject much more semantic information. Like if you saw like what Michael did with deep bugs and these things, if you want to reduce the false alarm or false error rate significantly, you will need to carry in much more semantic information. That's at least my intuition for the other tasks, like method names and variable names. These things do, like the syntactic features do surprisingly, or as a PL person I would say, frustratingly <laughs> well. Uh, uh, Martin was first. I have a question, like for the variable misuse, yes. like how does uh, the techniques that Mike, Michael described, like where you're generating negative data, would this be helpful for you? So I think it, it should. I mean, the question would be here. I mean, in some sense, we are generating uh, neutral data by creating these candidate nodes and essentially saying that the graph should look identical at this point. You can argue that you create two versions of the graph. And you have the real one and the negative uh, thing. And you try to classify which is the right thing. We haven't tested this. It could work. I I don't know if Michael has any intuition on that. Uh, well, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so as a follow-up to this, uh, what problems you saw the bugs are synthetic data, right? They're not like uh, real bugs. It's like. So you mean the variable misuse? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, this is the super uh, the training. So in that in that sense is. It's as unsupervised as word to vec in that sense, right? It's uh, you. It's uh, it's unsupervised in the sense that you don't know. You know the ground truth because you believe what the developer has done, and in 99% of the times, most of the code will be correct. Uh, so it's uh, we don't have a supervised data in the sense that people said this is a bug, this is not a bug, but we implicitly like this. I think Earl calls it the competent so, uh, <laughs> developer hypothesis. 
you have the issue there that uh, this might trigger to often like too many false positives? I mean, you have a you have uh, a confidence threshold, and yes, obviously the eighty five percent accuracy that uh, we I showed or something less that's not maybe good enough for things, and you always have the probabilities where you can tune the precision recall uh, to get the desired false positive ratio, and that's true with anything in machine learning. Yeah, so I guess in practice, uh, what uh, bugs we've seen, I think these small variable misuse bugs, you don't, you probably, people probably catch them earlier before they actually commit because they run the test suite or something like that. But we find a lot of those bugs in logging, in testing, uh, in, uh, in places where people don't actually write, uh, no one tests the tests, no one uh, write unit tests for their logs. Well, not no one, but mostly no one, uh, th things like that. Okay, I think I'm keeping people away from lunch, which is... <laughs> uh. We want like uh, conversation topics over lunch. Uh, let's thank Milos again.